with your CNSM faculty. Um, I know a lot of you are, are here for the NSCI course, so before we get started with the panel, I just want to go over a few things. Um, I've been getting a lot of questions with regards to the points, what do they mean, do I have to go to every single event, and you don't, okay? Uh, the course uh, is going to allow you to choose what, uh, what uh, event you can go to. If you cannot do an event, then you can do a module. I know the modules are not up yet. I know a lot of you have been looking for them. So they will be up by next week. Um, so don't worry, you're not behind. We, we know that you haven't started with the modules. You'll have plenty of time during the semester. Um, and this CI-198 is your freshman success course. So it's not meant to be a stressful course, okay? It's meant to be a, a resource for you. Uh, it's meant to be, uh, you know, a place where you can go for resources that have to do with um, academic skills, academic habits, that have to do with your transition, right? Transition from high school to college um, might be different than what you had in mind, right? Or you might, you know, still have some bad habits that you brought with you from high school. So there's going to be um, a lot of good... Um, articles and videos that you can see uh, in there. And again, like I said, the Thrive Events programs are also going to be uh, something that I highly recommend that you go to uh, because not only are we wanting you to make the transition to college, but we want you to be engaged in your community, right? So all of you here, you're all CNSM students, and most of you are in your first year. So. Uh, network, get to know each other, you're going to be going through your programs together, and uh, it's important that you engage in CNSM community, right? And so for that reason, we brought our faculty that are here, who are very excited to meet you, and that are always available uh, to talk to you guys. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention is I have a QR code here on your way out, please scan it. That's how you're going to uh, give me your evaluation of the program, and it'll help me to uh, make the program a lot better for you. Okay? Um, let's see. So let me see if I co covered all my points. Yeah, so if there's scheduled conflict, don't worry, just choose another event. Um, okay, so for our panel, Okay, we want to make this uh, casual. It's not something to be, you know, formal. Um, this is for you guys. So I have some scripted questions uh, for your faculty, but definitely this is going to be guided by you. What are you? What are your burning questions? Right? What is it that you want to know about the experience, the classroom experience? You know. Uh, so, with further ado, without further ado, I will have our faculty introduce themselves, and we can do popcorn. Whoever wants to go first. Thank you, Raisa. I am Raisa Hernandez Pacheco. I'm an assistant professor of biomedical sciences. I am an ecologist. Um, I work with animal populations, and I try to understand why within the same population, individuals vary in many different aspects. Um, I have taught general ecology, population ecology, and biostatistics. Thank you. Hi, my name is Andreas Biel. Uh, I'm in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Uh, I'm a condensed matter theorist. I work on uh, superconductivity, magnetism, uh, topological systems, uh, uh, mostly theoretically, that means uh, uh, paper and pen and the computer. And, uh, I teach currently more masses classes, masses students classes, but I have also taught on the level 151, 152. Some of you have to take that or hundred or hundred. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Jason Schwanz. I'm in the chemistry and biochemistry departments, and go through the same list. Our Lab really can study how enzymes work. Since enzymes are rich in biology, it's the most common drug target, and most diseases are associated with enzymes. And so, 
a lot of members of the lab, undergraduates and master's students are involved in a drug design project linking molecules to inhibit an enzyme associated with Alzheimer's disease and others were designing enzymes, comparing different organisms to see how evolution works and how we can actually make them better. So I actually sit at the interface of organic chemistry and biochemistry, taught NSCI 198 when I was in person with all the chem biochem majors, um, so that was always interesting. Trusted me to teach that class. And, then, uh, and for the primary class that I teach, it's organic chemistry. So for anyone who's just looking forward to taking organic chemistry, says word on the street is one of the best classes that you'll ever to take, but I'm slightly biased. Uh, maybe I'll see you in my class. And I'm Andrea Johnson. I teach math courses for the math department. And my lab is the classroom because I'm a math educator. My work has been mostly in math education. I teach math education courses, but also a lot of freshman courses. Since I've been an educator of K through 12, I help with the transition of freshmen into the college arena. So happy to see you all. Thank you. Thank you all. So uh, let's see. We're now on the third week, right? So, you know, students are starting to get the swing of things. They're starting to get settled. Uh, do you have any advice for them as they start to settle in this semester? And like I mentioned, most of them students are first year students. Anyone want to answer that? Yes. Time management. So you got through the first couple weeks of chaos, which you couldn't figure out your life until you knew what it was about. So now's the time to figure out actually how you're going to structure your time when you study and when you don't. So. How many of you are full-time students? Or, yes, full-time students. How many of you are full-time employees of a job? Like work 40 hours a week? As a student of 15 units, you actually are expected to do 40 hours of work a week as a student. So you're full-time employees as a student. So I would say time management is probably the biggest thing starting in week three to think about. I'm usually too far behind to think about time management. So, uh, I just don't have to go up and down. I think one of the, just quickly the things I've seen too is learn out what learn what works and what does not. I know a lot of times we have maybe a, a quiz and people will say, "Oh, I thought I was really studying hard for that," and I, but then I didn't do nearly as well as I want. I'm going to try to shout over the desks moving. Yes, but uh, you know, if if something didn't work out, there's always there's plenty of time to recover in the class, and you want to make changes and be malleable. And talk to your professors, instructors. I think most of us are reasonably nice. I'm trying to become much more intimidating uh, in age, but uh, you know, see, go through with them what's working and what's not working. And a lot of times, they just suggestions, things that you think are obvious, and a lot of times they are. But sometimes it just takes a little bit of reinforcement. What do they do? I don't know. Getting into groups. Yeah. She wants to find out. <laughs> yeah, possibly yeah. groups. So I would say also, don't forget the, the, the basics that you have learned in your families. Uh, you have to sleep enough, you have to eat healthy, you have to do some sport, you have to meet family, you have to meet friends. All that you cannot forget it when you when you start studying. It's not all about just studying, 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 because at some point you burn out. So you need this equilibrium, you have to find a, a good equilibrium. And uh, don't panic. Uh, you know, the beginning is hard. I, when I was uh, started, which is long ago, yeah. but I, I, I remember it was very hard for me, actually. But, and so it's not the case for everyone, but uh, you, you can get through it. It's just, uh, you, but you have to find also a good community of friends with whom you can share you, your your complaints and uh, your joys and, uh, and and walk forward. written a physical one or, or a computer one. For instance, there's, um, if it's not in my schedule, it doesn't exist in my life, so that's how I move every day. Um, so just try to be organized and, and get that into the routine of being organized, otherwise it will be very overwhelming, or it could get very overwhelming, so start practicing that time management. I would say another thing about that yeah. too is yeah. you'll notice about like the way you um, work better like might be in the morning or the afternoon or in the evening. I remember when I was a freshman I just assumed I was going to 
go to my classes in the morning and then I would do all my homework at night. For some reason that was what I thought the pattern should be, but I realized pretty quickly that I couldn't concentrate at night and it would take me like twice as long to do an assignment if I put it off into the evening. And it was more stressful because it was due you know, the next day. So figure out when you're most productive and able to focus and then try to plan your times of work around those times. It doesn't necessarily mean you're shoving all your work in and in the evening. And speaking of homework, uh, one thing that is useful uh, is to not do, like uh, you have homework due uh, Friday, that you do everything on Thursday evening. Because you need, uh, things are more complicated than it was uh, in high school, so you need more time to think about it, it's just normal. And so it's better to spread it, take one hour, one hour chunks where you work on something, or one and a half hours, it depends on you, uh, how you function. Yeah. But uh, spread it over the week, so you do a little bit of this, and a little bit of that, and etc. as you work it. That allows you to rethink things, and uh, you progress better, you solve problems better, and, uh, and you are not panicking at the end, because now you have only this chunk of time to, so, to, to do your, your homework, and uh, there is not, no other possibility, so you don't have time to ask your friends, or, or your, the faculty, etc. So spread your homework over, for each class, over the week. If you all need um, assistance on how to m not only manage your time, but how to calendar it and how to be sure to uh, make room for all the things that uh, they've been talking about, we have the Learning Center uh, that is literally right next to the Hall of Science in the uh, Student Success Center. And the Learning Center um, actually will have academic coaches that will sit down and work with you on your plan schedule. They'll give you some homework as far as track your first week or the, the next week that you have coming up and look to see where your time goes from the morning you get up to the morning you go to sleep. And uh, that's really good for you because it allows to see where there are gaps and where you can either chill, relax, or you can actually head to the library and study, or you can go to professor office hours. Uh, so, and, but uh, as well, you know, as, as Professor Bill said, you, you want to still keep your lives, right? You, we're not saying be a science or a math student and, and forget, you know, about your lives. That's really important because it's, it's part of being balanced, right? Uh, so, uh, with that, um, I'm going to move on to the next topic, but if anyone has any follow-up to that, any questions or any questions that you have? How many of you are struggling with time management right now, let's be honest? Like a bit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's totally normal and yeah, yeah. there's nothing wrong with you. You're probably doing all your work and that's why you feel that way. <laughs> so, yeah. But if you need support, go to your professors or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you have my email now, so just shoot me an email, let me know, hey, what was it you were talking about with the Learning Center, and I'm, I'm more than happy to give you that resource. And in your NSCI 198, there's actually videos from the academic coaches from the Learning Center that talk about some of these topics. Okay. In physics, we also have, for those who do physics, we have a workshop actually that we organize at the beginning of that academy for master's students and undergrads uh, about time management. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For those who are in physics, you should look, check your emails when it comes out. It's going to be uh, one or two weeks or so. Very good. Okay, so I have another question. Um, for you all. Um, how do you like for your students to communicate with you? You know, um, what's the etiquette or what your preference is? You know, do you like it best via emails or, you know, before or after class? Um, do you like them coming to your office hours? Like, what, what is your preference when it comes to communication? I um, Well, this, this, I guess, my value as professor. So that's something that you want to know during the first week of class. And that's a good question for the professor. Um, but uh, I would say in general, definitely office hours are the least used, 
but the best thing there is, and we can talk about that later. Um, uh, and in my case, for instance, as, uh, emails are great because I look at my email most of the time, right? Um, so it's a quick, easy way to um, approach uh, informally uh, a professor, depending on the email, right? Um, if it's just a quick question, that can be informal. If there are other things that maybe we talk about a little bit later about how to approach your research interest, then maybe you want to do something a little bit more elaborate. Um, and yeah, and then of course, uh, during, I think after class, uh, especially office hours are after class, you can just walk with your professor to the office and you know, kind of build that relationship through the semester. So I prefer if they communicate with me in French, but I could never enforce it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a bit of a problem. But I'll, I'll make it also in English. But, uh, uh, so I agree with her. The, the, the office hours are really a good place to meet individually. And then after the class, if, if the, the faculty is not teaching right after, then it's a good time to ask questions. Email, you just have to realize that uh, as faculty, we get a lot of emails. And uh, you have to imagine if each of you, uh, let's say even 10% of you have a question tonight. That means we get about 10 emails or uh, 12 emails, and we want to answer them correctly. And that takes a lot of time. And then we have families also. And so we, if you send us an email at 10 PM, uh, you cannot expect that at 10.05 we will have an answer for you. Not because we don't want to, but we, it's just an invitation of life. Right? So uh, plan a bit ahead. If you send an email, just it could be that it's the next day. It could be that uh, the, the faculty decides to answer you and everybody else at the same time the next day or the next class. Uh, so, so if you have a kind of a, a real question that you would like to do the rest of the office hours, I think you have to class. Yes. The safest way. Okay. I'll echo the same, and I think one of the nice things after class is depending on what's going on with your schedule is if there's something fresh in your mind, if you have a question or you can't read what's on the board, and you say, oh, can you go back? I can't read what that was, or I have a question about this and that. It's fresh, and a lot of times if there's other people around too, they may have questions that were similar to yours. Is there something I said? <laughs> there was no seat for him. Oh. It's not that bad. <laughs> and, yeah, I think the office hours, just to reiterate that, it's uh, just the way I try to do it is right after the classes, I have the office hours, and a lot of times there'll be a group of people who might come over with questions, and even if you don't have a specific question, just being in that environment, listening again, finding, oh, I have a question similar to that, or that reminds me of this, a lot of times you might find something that's, that's interesting. A lot of times people have found study partners and things like that, just in those sorts of interactions, and... Yeah, with the email, I think kind of a touchy one too is we do get a lot of emails and I try to answer them somewhat rapidly and if not, then I'll pin it so it's up to the top of I remember. But we do occasionally miss some every once in a while. So in turn, it depends on the person. For me, if, if you don't get an answer after not five minutes, but in a day or so, I'm fine if someone emails me again because I, I forgot uh, about it. And you can kind of gauge what the, the time is. Well, and that's for anything. I'm also an advisor for all the biochemistry majors, and so like, we get all sorts of emails for advising and things like that. And so I try to answer, but I have to admit sometimes I have missed one here and there. And so it's not that we're ignoring you, it's just that you made a mistake. I'm not, are you ignoring me? You're ignoring me, Victor. Yeah. <laughs> Did you send me this? <laughs> so if you email me twice, I'm probably going to get annoyed. Yeah. I don't ever miss anything. Yeah. Yeah. There's no email that I don't miss. Yeah. Yeah. So if somebody emails me, then I probably have a 100% response rate. And if I see two blue dots from the same person, I might like want to pull my eyes out. So this is how instructors are different. I won't respond in any kind of rude way if I get more than one email from an individual student, of course. But in, in my mind, I'll be like, ugh. Um, solution. Sorry. Don't be, you're fine. Um, but right after class is a really good time to follow me to my office and ask questions. Also, I really do agree that like office hours are great because that's where you meet the other people who loiter in the office, and a lot of times they create like the strongest study groups together. So um, office hours are a great place. The I would say um, 
Emails are great for me though. I respond to like 100 emails a day from students because I teach subjects that maybe it's easier for me to respond with emails or ask your teacher what my students know about those. Um, I can just like bang out those those responses like a bunch in a day, so that's no problem for me. Maybe if I was teaching organic chemistry, it'd be like a paragraph response, whereas I'm like... It's hard to communicate structures. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, distribute your negative, boom. All right, it, you know, simplify your denominator, boom. So I don't mind those at all. So it really sounds like it is up to the professor how best to communicate. Sorry, we can generalize that. <laughs> no, no, and it, it's not meant to be. Actually, what we were leading to with this is that more, the most important thing that they've mentioned is talk to your professor and see what they prefer, right? As you can see, there's a variety of responses here. Um, as far as email etiquette, you know, don't say, hey, you know, how's it going? <laughs> you want to be formal, right? You want to be formal with your professor. Some don't care, and if they tell you at lecture, at lecture just call me Jason, or, you know, uh, whatever, then they've given you the uh, more of a casual, you know, type of interaction. But always, you know, um, address them by Mr. or Ms., you know, Santos, and then you go on to, to give, you know, uh, whatever it is that you're requesting. The other thing is that the etiquette for when to respond to you uh, in business, in business time is two days, maybe. 24 to 48 hours. Uh, so don't keep sending because you're not getting a response. They've seen it. You know, if by the third day, let's say, you have not gotten a response, then you can do a nudge. You can let them know. Include the thread of the original message that you sent so that they remember, oh yeah, so and so had already, this person had already contacted me. Okay? Um, and it's business hours, so that means that the weekend doesn't count, right? So, you know, uh, some of us don't work throughout the weekend, just like you guys. <laughs> so, I will yeah. say, too, I teach large lecture classes, so even if you think you're bugging me by emailing me or coming to my office, it's not at all. It's actually making that class more personal for me. And it makes it much more enjoyable for me to teach a room of 150 people. If I know several of them, even if they're requesting things from me or like they feel like they're bugging me or something, it's never bug bugging me. It actually makes the people real to me, if that makes sense. So I would say probably that's common with professors as they enjoy getting to know their students. It makes it more enjoyable to teach people who you know. <laughs> Another thing I want, oh, did we have some? No, uh, uh, it's really true that uh, you don't, you should not feel that you are annoying us if you ask questions via email or come to see us. It's definitely, you know, this is our job, but that's what we love doing. And uh, so, so we are there actually to help you, you know, acquire the material and uh, become professionals and so on. So we are ready to answer the questions. And it, for me also, I must say, so I don't have this 100% uh, response rate on one like Jason. And I'm fine if you, after a day or two, uh, you send me an email saying, did you have a chance to uh, think about the email or have you seen the email I sent uh, the other day and you put the thread under it? And then I know, oops, this one I forgot. And then I generally respond right away. So I'm sure I don't miss it. And that can happen often. So don't get annoyed at faculty who don't respond right away. Don't get depressed either. It's not that we don't care about you, etc. It's just we can miss it. And I'm pretty sure you miss also sometimes email or text. The uh, thing I wanted to mention about professor uh, office hours. If uh, your professor seems a little intimidating or you've just never done it before, take a buddy with you. You know, someone that's in the class or, or even a friend you know, and I think that that way it just makes it where it's not just focused on you. Uh, it's, you know, an opportunity for the both of you to ask your questions uh, together. And let's say that you are okay with the material, but you just want to talk about something. That's okay. They, they love sharing their experience, you know, their career, um, and they love helping students as well. So 
Um, as you're all adjusting, you know, in the next few years, you're going to start developing ideas as far as like, okay, this is my path, right? This is where I want to go, but I'm not sure. Let me talk to, you know, my professor. They might be able to uh, have some ideas for me. Has anybody gone to office hours yet? To some professor's office hours? Good experience? Okay. Mm -hmm. Tell your friends. <laughs> they don't fight. <laughs> okay, no questions? Still no questions? You're all so shy. Okay, okay. So, okay. So, as students move towards their first exams in the next few uh, couple weeks, probably, um, what is your suggestion on how to prepare uh, for the exams? And anyone can answer. Well, comes back to what I said earlier. Distribute the work. Don't do everything the last night. Even though I did that as a student too, <laughs> I, I, I studied the whole night to, to be ready. And the reason why I say you should not do it this way is because in fact now in retrospect, I think uh, I did not learn as much as I could have if I had uh, distributed the work a lot. It's just our brain needs time, we need time to think. It's, nothing is obvious. And so even now, yeah, I mean, after many years in the profession, you, 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 it's just simply uh, problems we are dealing with are not easy to solve. And so we need time to get to it. So don't do everything just the time before. This is what to do. Yeah, so these things apply to other disciplines. I'll put it in the context just of chemistry since that's what I know. I think. You know, I, don't, I don't want to lecture anyone, but in particular, just don't go back and passively read the notes. If you're solving problems, ask why that problem, what's that question asking, what's the underlying basis of that problem? Hopefully there is one for each thing that you're doing. And share with your friends, explain the concepts to them. They might have, as, as long as you have a good resource there, they might have, oh, I didn't understand that, or I thought I understood that, but now I don't, and go back and forth. And I think when taking exams, at least I see this in organic chemistry, one of the biggest challenges is knowing where to start in a problem because if an exam is covering chapters one through four and you're working through the end of the chapter problems or whatever in chapter one, you know it's material in chapter one. But then on the exam, a lot of times like, I've never seen this before, I don't know what's when all the material that we've seen, but if you just distill it down and kind of figure out where to start, a lot of times it'll lead you to the right answer. So I think just taking that approach when you're solving the problems too, actively asking along the step, breaking every question down into smaller questions. If it's a larger, it's as small as an acid as a base, whatever that might be. You actually answer about five different questions on your way just to solving one problem. It takes time, but then you can use that same approach in your exams as well. I'm hoping that I give enough practice to where if you've done all the practice, aka homework, um, then you've been sufficiently prepared. If you like, I don't know, fake your way through some of the homework, then maybe you won't be prepared. But my hope is to give sufficient practice with the homework so that you have prepared yourself. And so you only need to do a little bit of freshening up before an exam. So commit yourself during, be focused when you're doing your practice. And I think that that has the bigger payoff. You don't have to cram or study so much. I'm not going to tell you anything you don't know. At this point, you know you have to study, and you have to do it with time, period. So there's no magic answer. So you have to put time, and therefore you have to organize yourself. Um, I have been learning a little bit about how K-12 is, is happening here, and there's no reassessment here. So if you come from that kind of school, do not expect your grade will be magically uh, changed. You have to think and self-evaluate and, and see if, if that first exam didn't go well, then how can you change center student habits? And of course, we're here to support you, but it also depends on your um, own habits and practices. And so take the time. Now is when you have more time because it's the start of the semester. Take your time to organize yourself. Um, and you have to keep up with the material because it's going to accumulate. Um, so you know the answer to that question. How can you study? And then seek help. So evaluate your health-seeking behavior, and we're here to help you. But you still need to come up with um, maybe certain changes from high school <coughs> to college now. I'm 
just a follow up to that is once they get their exam back, you know, what, um, what, uh, what has students that have above 90% and they still want to look at their exams. Um, and, and I haven't made a study out of this, but out of observations, the lowest the score, the least that person goes to the office hours. Um, and so the strategy of going to the office hours and discussing the exam with your professor is it has to do with everything that they mentioned. The second strategy, the, the professor will know you. And we are human beings. What I mean is that you want the professor to know you and that you are interested in improving. And you want the professor to know your name and that kind of stuff, right? So two good strategies um, to, to start implementing now in your life in the college. Just go to office hours after that first exam, especially. Do professors actually have time for office hours? Or are they required to stay? Or is it like not mandatory and it's their choice? Good question. So depending on the units uh, of the class is the amount of hours we are we need to offer um, office hours. So every single professor in the syllabus should have office hours. It's not optional. Mm -hmm. we, we have to have office hours. And you can require it. If, uh, if that doesn't happen, you have to talk with the advisor of the, of the, of the, of the department or maybe the seminar or something like that. Because that should not happen. I should have office hours that you have, have access to. I'm not talking about a specific exam. Just yeah, no, in general. Yeah, for any class, for any, any course. Any other questions? Um, how how easy is it to get like involved with research here? And do you usually have to wait until you have like a baseline level of knowledge before you start asking for person? I, I I can start. That's a great question. I know it was in the list. Um, no, you don't have to wait. I guess is the final answer. Um, but of course, that depends on the research group that you want to be in as well as professor or principal investigator that will set their own rules of how to you know, invite or welcome students. Um, um, my recommendation is if you are already looking and if you are already interested, you should start contacting people no matter at what moment in your career you are. Um, and, and, and then you start that conversation and maybe those that question is really for the individual principal investigator or professor, right? So, um, but it, it's, it's often, um, often we receive students interested when they are already almost about to graduate and that's really not the best thing to do, so that's why I definitely encourage you to start thinking about that as quickly as possible because if you want to be productive in, in, a, in a lab or a research team, it takes more than one semester, right? And so if all you have to offer is one semester, that could also be uh, something that that particular professor might not be looking for, right? Um, and I, what was another question about it? How to approach? Um, definitely just, well, I'm from biology, so in, in, in the web page of biology, then you have the whole list of faculty members and you have the whole list of contact information and what in general they do, I always say, nobody will do it for you, you have to start your own research. Look at the page, read it, and try to think about what really and honestly you are interested in. And then contact that person, and then sit down with them and talk to them. I would say it's, it's, it's good if you can do some research uh, over time, and it does take more than a semester you need it. Sometimes summer is also a good time, and you have less classes to take, and you have time to do that. Um, the only thing I would say, you know, it's the third week. So you don't need to be in a lab on the fourth week. Uh, so take the time to settle down, to adapt to the new place, environment. It's really different from high school. I mean, you noticed it already now, but it's just another way of operating, of thinking, of uh, acting. The time management is just because not everything is set for you. Uh, you have to come up with your own program, etc. 
and time management. And so, so if you are not, uh, you know, you need a few weeks for that, and then uh, over time you can go see your faculty also. It depends also a little bit on the department. So in our department, go see your undergrad advisor in physics. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, that advisor will help you find someone uh, or int introduce you to someone, uh, to a faculty. Now, if you are really passionate about a spe specific topic, at least in physics, sometimes you do need a little bit of uh, knowledge before you can actually start working on some stuff. Uh, I mean, I think it's in all departments. It really depends on, on the topic. And uh, so some faculty will say no, but not because they don't want to help you in the group. It's just it needs a little bit more, maybe a class or two that you need to take before you can actually talk about that project. So, so that can also happen. But it's never a rejection uh, because of you or because by principle. It's just practical. Uh, the, the, you know, if somebody says no, it's not. Or because they, they have already so many students, they cannot take one more, and so on. And you all only are going to figure that out if you talk to them. Right. So that's the point. You have to make the move. Yeah. I'll just say two quick things on top of it. It's a great question. So the, what were they? Oh, the first one is a lot of times, like, I'll tell people that Organic, being in organic chemistry is a good time to start for like our particular work so that we have the language. But some of the members of the lab have come from general chemistry and they stayed throughout their entire time and then went on their PhD programs in chemistry or biochemistry because they knew their calling right away. And so it's, it's not like there's a requisite that's required for that. And the other thing is like what was said is uh, one of the downsides is a lot of times there's more people interested in the labs than there are spaces or those that we can accommodate. And so someone might write with this great description, I'm really interested in your lab for X, Y, and Z, and I have to write back, unfortunately, I cannot take any more students at this time. It sounds like it's a great fit, but please contact me near the end of the semester. And if I think people might be graduating in spaces might, might open, and I'll remember that. And so when you write back, or if you're still interested, then you're already progressing towards that, so it's not too early. And please, if you're gonna make the move, that's one of those emails that you really want to take time to, uh, you know, elegantly express why you really are interested in this lab. Uh, because again, we can get several emails, and if the email just have one sentence saying, "Oh, I think it's cool what you do," I don't. I mean, why would I take this person over another person that has taken the time to say, well, I have taken these classes, I really enjoy population ecology, and therefore I think I am a good fit because I'm interested in this. You know, so be, I mean, really think about it um, and be honest with yourself. Do you really are interested in this? Why? And then tell that to the person. Thank you, thank you. And I do have a couple notes on that as well. Um, the CNSM um, SAS Center, uh, you all heard of the SAS Center, SAS, Jensen SAS? Okay. Um, we're, so we're housed in the Hall of Science, and uh, in, in our area we have a research program coordinator. So if you have any follow-up questions with regards to research, please contact her. Her name is Cheyenne Ramon. And she will be having a panel next week on the 14th. And her panel is going to be of students that, are, that are, have done or that are currently doing research, as well as alumni. So don't miss, don't miss that. It's virtual. So you know you can do it from home or wherever you're at. Um, but it's a great opportunity for you to start getting introduced to it. But I, I do want to echo that you don't have to do it now. Um, or even your first year if you don't feel you're ready. If you feel you've got to focus on school right now, getting the hang of things, that is okay. Um, your sophomore year, before you leave your freshman year, then start putting your feelers out, you know, talking to faculty. And uh, so that when you come back to your sophomore year, you might have, you know, something already set up. Um, so. Those are the two things. Um, now, somewhat of a more fun question for you all. <laughs> so can you tell us uh, what kind of student were you your first few years? <laughs> no? Yes? <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> well, I mean, um, 
I think that there's always the perception that when, like for example, I can speak for myself, that uh, you know now as a professional there's the perception that I always had it together, and I didn't. You know, my first semester I struggled. Uh, I struggled a lot. Not only was I doing the transition from high school to college, but I moved away. So then there was that homesickness, right? And then I also was from a low-income family, mostly Mexican in my community, So, and I went to an affluent university. And so so there's different things that you experience your, your first year, and, and I'm sure a lot of you are experiencing some of that um, and might relate. So, you know, sometimes I feel it's okay for us to talk a little bit, you know, a little bit more personal so that they also can get to know us. I can go. I probably had a non-traditional, well nobody's traditional I guess, that's what you're saying. Um, I left home when I was 17, I was kind of a runaway, staying at friends' houses. I don't know how I had the, comp the sense to go to college, but I came here, um, put it on my credit card each semester. Totally screwed up my first semester because I fell asleep right outside there on the grass and missed a chemistry class and I failed that test and I was debilitatingly shy so I just failed that class and um, got my act together the second semester. Actually showed up, realized 8 a.m. classes I need to wake up a bit early for to be on campus. Um, but I worked full time and so it was really, really challenging. I was managing a retail store 40 hours a week and also going to school, figuring it out very, very slowly. I think it took me five years to graduate. <laughs> but that's my non-traditional story. Once I got my act together and I realized when I could figure out how to study and space things out like you were mentioning, that it all became like doable. It was all time management issues. And if I had a problem with a class, it was not because I was not capable of the material, it was definitely because I didn't know how to budget my time. So that's why I emphasize time management. So there's my story. <laughs> well, mine's going to sound relatively dull compared to that, but I guess uh, <laughs> overall, I grew up in South Dakota. Uh, has anyone ever been to South Dakota? <laughs> okay. Just kidding, I just had to. No, I haven't. Well, that seems about right. But uh, no, I guess I. I went to a college in my uh, local town that because that was the only place I applied. It was, seemed like the place to go, and I was always interested in chemistry for some reason. I was actually a chemistry and music major. There's not a whole lot of overlap in the classes, and so I was just taking a ton of classes. But for the future, then I just knew I didn't want to go to medical school, and then because I was in science, that seemed like the thing to do. And always really like biochemistry and such and so I was focused on all of the classes but not so much the big picture looking back I was really fortunate after that for graduate school and so on to follow this path but I could try to present it like I did this because of this because of this but that's not all the way it was and there's one thing is for when I came here now some time ago one thing that really attracted me are the opportunities that we offer for undergraduate students in research and these other things to provide these opportunities in science, what, no matter what it is that you, what you want to do. And so I'm not being, well, I actually am directly, indirectly being paid to say this as an employee here. But uh, I think take advantage of those those opportunities, because I think that's one thing that uh, Long Beach really excels in. I, maybe they were in my uh, college, but I never really saw them out. So. Um, I, I stayed all, up all night the night before studying for exams. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it was difficult for me to start. Uh, the first year was really hard. I was kind of depressed and uh, it was, I had the feeling always that everybody else understood better than I did. And many did, but <laughs> still not everybody. And also there were, I was impressed by some uh, other students who gave the feeling that they always understand everything and uh, it's easy for them, etc. And now in retrospect, I, I know for a fact, and I can assure you this is true for you too, even if people claim that they, they have it all uh, together, well, if you would dig, if you could read in their mind, if you could see their, their situation, uh, how they live, where they live, etc., you would realize that they're actually cooking with water also, and, uh, you know, uh, and uh, it's not so much different from your situation. 
So don't be too impressed by others. I mean, there are some students who are just excellent and they do well and they fly over everything. I was not one of them, and many of the others were not like that either, even though some of those who pretended to be. So don't be, so I think I always think it, it's better to start low key. You don't know it all, you cannot, uh, you fail at this homework and that one, but you get back on your feet, you try. I mean, we say, oh, we take the example, many of you do skateboarding, or you do dancing, or you, you play an instrument, or, or you play a sport. Uh, uh, none of you, none of us, uh, uh, after trying once, says, well, this is not for me, I cannot do it, or et cetera. You just have to get back up to it, uh, you know, back on your own skateboard and try again and try again and try again until you really manage to do it. And this is true for science. Uh, 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 you, you just have to try it, try again, and not be depressed. Uh, I mean, I speak now from my point of view. Yeah. <laughs> not be depressed if it doesn't work right away. It just takes time, and uh, and, it, uh, and you will you will make it. You will do it. You just need the resources. Don't do everything on your own. Also, one thing is, don't think that because you have the lowest grade of the class, which you should not know if it's the case or not, but if you feel like you are so, so bad, that you sh it's, a, it's a shame for you to go see the faculty. We are not there to judge whether you are intelligent or not. Because like she said, you are intelligent because you are here. You were admitted and so for your qualifications and you, you can make it. Uh, and we are not interested, we are not gauging each student who is intelligent, who is not. I don't care. Really. What I care about is that where you are, how can you progress and get better at what you do? And get what you need to, to, to become professional. So that's what matters. And so even if you bond the exam or so, then go see the faculty and, uh, and, uh, and see how you can improve. That's what matters. And our role as faculty is to help you improve and get on your feet and, and, and become excellent. So the goal for me was always that the students that I teach should become better than I am. And so that's the, that's the purpose yeah, of being here as a faculty. And so at least I've been married to me. And so, so just yeah, take the energy and get back on your feet and, and move forward. I, I don't know what to say, but I think I would say that, well, I'm from Puerto Rico, and my wife is in Puerto Rico, born and raised bachelor's, PhD, everything there. Um, first generation, uh, first one with a bachelor's degree in my, in my house, uh, which means that they don't have any idea what I do. Um, and so uh, even though the question was about first year, I'm gonna talk to you about as, as a doctor, um, because maybe some of you will go through the same thing, and that means that you are in a party at your house with all the family, and nobody cares about what you do because they don't understand what you do and therefore you cannot talk about what you do with them. And there is a certain solitude that you will feel. Um, and, and that's okay. You know, I have embraced it and, and, and it's okay because why would my parents understand that? So um, be ready for that. Um, try to engage them, but it's not your job to engage them. If it happens, it happens. If it not, move on, you have everyone here to talk about what you do, right? Um, so uh, I guess some of us definitely understand some of the issues of becoming a college graduate, um, and, and, and we're here to talk a little bit about that, too. Thank you. Thank you all. Any other questions? No? OK, well, we will actually close now. I think with a little bit of time, if any of you are interested in speaking to some of our faculty for here. Um, and again, don't forget to scan the QR code on your way out for uh, the evaluation for us. Thank you.